Tacky Talk Time, folks. State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy is joining us for our uh, first Tacky Talk of April 2024. Tacky, did you survive April Fool's Day? I have managed April Fool's Day. Uh, welcome to Choose Tacky Tuesdays, I suppose we're going to call this. That's right. Uh, Instead of Tuesdays with Maury, it's Tuesdays with Tacky. <laughs> <laughs> I should make you all some tacos. Um, so, uh, no, uh, so I April Fools. Uh, kudos to uh, Senator John Keenan for his April Fools video of the year. Uh, I, uh, I greatly admire uh, his guts in putting something out in April Fools as an elected official because people would take us far, far too seriously. I have to be frank <laughs> regarding anything we say. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff we say is a pain, but at the same time, you can have a little fun as John did uh, regarding uh, defining what a dotted is in Massachusetts. I saw that he wanted to like ban Starbucks or something. I think. <laughs> yes, it's like the pro uh, Duncan's uh, video <laughs> on uh, banning Starbucks and basically uh, seize its property by eminent domain and <laughs> throwing it in harbor and all that stuff. I give John a lot of credit. That that was really funny. And yeah, he did a so, good job. If you haven't seen it yet, yet on X, you know you should. Um, you know, remind everybody as I often do, we're human as everybody else. And, uh, you know, we, sh we there's nothing that says we can't take advantage of, you know, innocent, fun, uh, good natured humor on July. I'm sorry, July is a different issue on uh, April 1st, uh, yesterday. So, you know, I, I do recommend people checking it out on uh, John Keenan's uh, uh, X account. Um, and, uh, you know, enjoy good life as much as everybody else. It's like a Christmas carols. Uh, during the holidays where uh, several news stations will uh, do short videos of uh, clips of people singing a song, various electeds around the state singing songs. So again, we're, we're as human as everybody else and we're you know, flawed and, but uh, you know, we're also sometimes know something and um, you know, why can't we have a little fun? You can, you absolutely can. And the nice thing is now with the social media, anybody can. So it's, you can always add add to your own version if you'd like. But the beautiful thing about John's video is the more serious he got, the funnier he got. If you if you know John exactly, that that's why it was so funny because he's usually a very serious kind of guy. Oh, he has a lot of restraint on his side. You get as serious as possible. So again, <laughs> much kudos to uh, John on a fun. Monday yesterday, a little clip. Yeah, yeah. Nothing nothing from you, though, Tacky. No, I'm not that funny, as you'll hear <laughs> from uh, me and Joe here as we do our little Abbott Costello routine. Um, we can take a guess who's the straight man every week. Uh, it's up to you to decide. Uh, but I was I was never much of an April Fool's prankster. Um, you know, I'm good in the zinger every so often. However, uh, to put together an elaborate uh, prank is a little beyond me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're in the new month of April now. We're getting closer and closer to uh, the end of the budget season. Yeah, I mean, the crescendo is starting to rise, meaning requests have uh, not surprisingly increased. And uh, the advocates have now started putting constituent emails into my email box as they activate their advocate machine on for or against an issue. Um, tomorrow, uh, we're in formal session. Uh, we believe we're going to do Chapter 90 funding this time of year. We actually will issue a bond bill, probably about $200 million, plus another maybe 40 or 60, depending on how much space we have uh, in terms of bond tolerance uh, for local bridge and road work, not state, local. This is basically free money uh, where the state adopts the uh, bond cost uh, to local communities. Quincy being one of the larger uh, communities is actually a very big beneficiary of the Chapter 90 bond bill. And once I actually have a, a solid number, we can talk about that next week. Um, but we also have been uh, putting in uh, several tens of millions of dollars, depending on how much we can afford, for what we refer to shovel-ready slash emergency work. This was a request from City of Town, City of Patrick administration. Yeah, we're going back in time here, so yeah, I can, I can remember a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, where they uh, asked for uh, an emergency fund on the side where they have unexpected costs um, and certain shovel-ready projects that have been languishing a bit on the local level. So... That's what we're thinking is going to happen. Of course, we live in a world of speculation and gossip. It's kind of the nature of the state house. But under all indications to me as we're doing Chapter 9 tomorrow, next week the House budget is released. We're going to talk about that next week uh, from Committee on Ways and Means. They're going to make a recommendation. Again, it is a recommendation, a subject to floor debate and, and approval by the members. And, of course, about 1,200 amendments are going to be filed. 
And uh, we've talked about this multiple times. It's going to be a lean budget. So, you know, I'm not uh, expecting a whole lot of uh, intricate surprises. What will be interesting is how much of the governor's uh, proposal survived the House Ways and Means recommendation. Uh, this includes things like um, the uh, low income fares for the MBTA. You know, she intends to fund this through ta taxpayer dollars. Uh, so, you know, obviously we'll see if something like that, for example, makes the final cut. Yeah, I think she was requesting $45 million for the first year of that program. Yeah, it's a pilot program. Uh, but as I like to say, once you provide a benefit to the public, it's hard to take it away. Mm. So we tend to proceed with caution. And uh, as I say, again, we're kind of revising estimates down for uh, the fiscal cycles, uh, this cycle and next cycle. Um, April returns, again, is critical for our estimates, 40% uh, of our Revenue comes in the second half of the year, especially the last couple of months, well, actually like 45%, but you know, 40 to 45% revenue second half of the fiscal year, the vast majority of it shows up in one month in April. Yeah, it's, so I think April 17th is the deadline this year for, for tax returns. Yeah, Patriot's Day is in a weird spot. So yeah. uh, we have to, after Patriot's Day, plus in Washington, D.C., they have Emancipation Day. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it is a public holiday. And since the IRS is based in Washington, D.C., they follow the public holidays in Washington, D.C. regarding a collection. So I believe Emancipation Day is the 16th? That's right. It's a Tuesday, yeah. Yeah, so you have a weird kind of long weekend to get your tax return that's done. Again, I don't recommend you wait to the last minute. Um, uh, if you're mailing something, obviously, you got to give time for the mail to arrive. It's... Mm -hmm. Those of you that have been kind of guessing when your bills get, because I still mail my bills, I have not gone to digital payment for whatever reason. I can't shake this practice I've done since I was a teenager. Um, I should modernize my way to pay my bills, but I just can't seem to shake the habit. Um, and, but I mean, I have been filing my taxes electronically. I like to do it that way, uh, particularly if you're going to get a refund. Um, it can be a little bit of a cost of using TurboTax, but the Department of Revenue actually has also its online system. So... If you want a TurboTax or, uh, or use h and Block or whatever, a software for your federal taxes and file for free, uh, many of them will do that for you. You can actually go to the Department of Revenue website and they have an opportunity to file your state taxes electronically. Yep, yep. And um, many times the cost of the software can be deducted, at least I think for your federal taxes. That's correct. Uh, your tax preparation, if you qualify... Well, if your uh, total Schedule A deductions exceed the standard deduction, uh, you can get uh, a greater deduction because you're, you're, stand, you're bigger than the standard deduction, which includes tax preparation, includes the software. So something to keep in mind, hold on to those receipts, obviously, for, for a couple of years. But, uh, you know, if you're looking to, you know, if you have a big enough situation, you're looking to add to your deductions, yeah, put on your Quicken, HR Block, or if you use a account to the tax service, you know, make sure you get a receipt from them when you pay your accountant or tax service, and you can add that to, you know, add that to your deduction or tell them to add it to the deduction if they forget when you double check your paperwork. Yes, yeah. So, you know, there's a uh, you know there's there's good opportunities to do that. Yeah, yeah. But local aid tax, Tacky, um, mayor here in Quincy was was complaining about the small increase he said the city is getting for the schools and for unrestricted aid. I think he said like th only a 300,000 increase on the school side and a 700,000 on the unrestricted aid side. Does that sound right? But well, the Chapter 70 money is a formula based on more of a real accuracy of what your school system looks like today. Yeah. And it has a lot of different factors, including a separate factor away from the Chapter 70 form itself regarding low-income students. And in the investment per pupil minimum cost. So the Chapter 70 formula for every community will, will slightly change every year, but I also like to remind folks that once we implemented the Chapter 70 formula, if I remember correctly, we went from essentially 28 million to almost $34 million. Great. So you know, seven plus million dollars for each year for the last two years. I think last year was almost 10 million. That sounds right. Yeah. So I mean, 17 million ish dollars, give or take a little bit uh, for the last two years. You know, uh, there's a, a giant chunk of change uh, mm. for the city, which budget is approximately what just under four hundred million now. I, yes. I, I looked at the Quincy Sun cover. I haven't had a chance to open yeah. this. No, that's about, that's about right. It was like three sixty two last fiscal year, so that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, you throw in local aid that you know, and the unrestricted local, aid, which is taxpayer money given for free, um, plus the lottery money. 
Um, you know, last couple of cycles, it was about 35 ish million dollars. So, I mean, if you're 40 million dollars, you know, 10, you know, not quite 10%, but you know, 40, 40 million bucks under just under 4 million bucks, give or take, you know, is, is, is state local aid. So give you an idea exactly how, um, how much uh, the state is participating in the budget, not including things like cultural council grants, the library assistance funding, the uh, council aging money, uh, school building, uh, school breakfast money, which is our state money, your taxpayer money goes to school breakfast and school lunches, which is not uh, a cost taken up. Um, we help pay for different public health issues in the local level. Um, and of course, a number of different grant programs, both not for profits in, in the state uh, to the city, for example, the hazmat equipment uh, training for the Boston Fire, I'm like Boston, Quincy firefighters. As you can tell, I'm kind of slurring my, my words, but Quincy firefighters are, you know, pay, uh, you know has a hazmat program paid by mm-hmm. the- uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, speak to Mariano has been championing cha- championing uh, those funds for for many many years. So, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of costs, and uh, I know it's not election years for the for the locals, but it's election year for us. And I don't disagree that you know that the uh, the aid formula for uh, Chapter seventy you know is now being you know adjusted based on real costs of the schools. But you know, keep in mind, I mean, they kind of neglected the. Uh, the generosity of the formula prior. And then chapter seven lottery money is based on projections of how much revenue is coming in. So if our revenue projections aren't that great, you know, it's going to be a trickle down effect to the local level. Right. So, yeah. you know, so belt tightening is going to be going all around to all municipalities yep. as well as the state as we try to, you know, move back to core services. And I can't speak for the city's priorities, but, you know, our, I fully expect ways and means to, to very much belt, out, belt tighten back to core services. Um, and then try to figure out from there what is, you know, considered uh, not a core service um, and, uh, you know, see what the appetite is to to see uh, if how generous or not, you know, in different parts of it. So, you know, I respect the city and the challenges they have regarding putting together the budget. At the same time, you know, I remind folks that the, sit, the state has been very generous when times are good, including a whole lot of opera money. And, I was just going to say a lot of that. The pandemic era funding is now gone, right? That's correct. Uh, every pandemic money be uh, totally uh, consumed at the end of the year um, because it's already been dispersed. Right. And, uh, you know, it's actually it's kind of unfortunate. I got a list from uh, ANF, Administration and Finance uh, Office, uh, to sent to the legislature every member regarding um, assistance in contacting certain uh, agencies and municipalities who have not responded to Administration and Finance's form for Funds. They just don't hand you a check. You actually have to fill out a form to the state to get your money that we've allocated to you, whether it be as ARPA money or state earmarks or targeted grant funds. You actually have to like sign for it. It's just like, here, hand you a check, right? Right, right. You actually have to sign off on receipt. And this includes capital projects too. For example, let's say the, there's like, you know, 10 grand for a sidewalk, just to make a random example, right? You know, you still have to sign, the city of town has to still sign off at that 10, 10 grand. So, you know, there's a lot of paper involved uh, on certain projects at the at our level, but most municipalities hopefully not do it. Not for profits, maybe less so. They're not used to being part of the state uh, recipients. Mm-hmm. They may not know how to do it, and there's some uh, barriers regarding um, how to fill the forms. But you know, I, I can tell right now, state agencies are eager to be helpful on mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. this. Oh, they have to yeah, and last I checked, Quincy hadn't done that yet. Yeah, I mean, they should have at this point. But yeah, but, yeah that's something they asked them, not me. I, I did yeah, see. No, I'm definitely going to. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, you see Councilor DeBota uh, last time. So, yeah, the council president I saw on April 1st uh, podcast. So, you know, uh, these are things to ask the local folks. I, I've done my part. Uh, but, you know, we like accountability. We don't know. We want, it's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, COD, cash and delivery, right? We want you to sign off, you know. Uh, on on receipt so well there needs to be a paper trail absolutely you know for to to be transparent well i have a a couple of funny stories which we can say for a different day regarding um missed done paperwork by a couple of a couple of towns which uh well not a couple actually one specific town which i won't name right now the way it worked for michael morrissey we had to get to a mystery of a missigned signed document Um, when i was in the senate it became like a one-week chase for me to find uh, these documents. This was before email. I mean, I was getting stuff faxed faxed into the office, not emails. Yeah, yeah. Paper hunt on on some errant documents from one of the towns um, Michael had represented at the time in the Senate. So 
you know, I'm, I'm, I won't say I'm an expert at all, but I am familiar there is accountability process. So, I mean, let's see how the city budget rolls along. Um, you know, this end, it's about turning all around. And, mm-hmm. you know, like us, uh, we make hard choices. The city make hard choices. There's consequences for making hard choices. Yep, yep. Um, we should probably talk a little bit about the uh, funding for the uh, migrant shelters and uh, that the House versus the Senate versions of those of those bills and the differences. Well, speaking of ARPA money, yes, uh, we have been using ARPA money to address the migrant crisis uh, for pretty much all this fiscal year. Mm. Uh, almost no taxpayer dollars from the state level has gone into migrant crisis. It's been all back foot for ARPA money. As I said before, Charlie Baker hid $2 billion from us. We've been trying to claw our way through the paperwork to find it all. Uh, and uh, we did. So, you know, that's kind of the thing that's been back uh, filling the migrant issue. Uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, there's no sign of it stopping. We have no predictability how this is going to go. And, you know, the, you know, the idea of children sleeping in the street is unacceptable. Again, this applies to pregnant women and young families of young children. It's not um, single males that are taking advantage of this uh, program. So this applies to any person that comes to the state. That includes local residents. And you know, the the job is to ensure that everybody's able to get helped, even though there's a cap on it. But at the same time, despite the cap, you know, uh, migrants are um, being temporarily housed any way they can with the state. And it's become a kind of an interesting issue on what this cap looks like, which to be honest with the administration can't explain to us. Leader uh, Alice Peich, you know, in the House, in the Speaker's leadership team has been charged as a point person to try to get to the bottom of this. And you know, she has the equal frustrations we have because she, of course, you know, works for us essentially, the House mm-hmm. members. Mm-hmm. charged by the speaker to tell us what's going on. And um, you know, she's found this rather frustrating experience as well. Mm. You know, it's, I mean, they're in, they're in hotels, they're in motels, they're in private residences in some cases, um, dispersed all over the state. Yeah, um, that's absolutely true. And uh, there's also added costs, which we, we have accounted for for this fiscal cycle, and we're going to have to account for the next fiscal cycle regarding uh, influx of residents, um, particularly children using school systems. Yep, yep. So mm-hmm. and, uh, the speaker, as we're speaking here, Tacky, the speaker's in the other studio <laughs> doing a program on this topic, actually. Uh, and I did poke my head in and heard him say, you know, this year's budget is pretty much set when it comes to this crisis. But for the next fiscal year, he's anticipating maybe a billion dollars uh, just to deal with this. That is the number that's floating around right now. As I remind folks, it's not a new experience having a shelter crisis reach close to a billion dollars. The problem was that we never had a billion dollars happen in one fiscal cycle. We've had it happen over multiple fiscal cycles, as, for example, the foreclosure crisis got worse and worse after the fiscal uh, financial crash in two, uh, 2009. It, the, uh, the t- it takes time for that crash to catch up regarding um, basic foreclosures. Remember all those homes? in all our neighborhoods that were kind of abandoned and people just walked away from them and it turned into like crepid. Yeah, they um, were all upside down in their mortgages. So they just put the keys on the table and walked away. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that guys? I mean, this happened in Quincy too. I mean, I remember, you know, actually when I was knocking doors in 2010, I, you know, saw more than a few uh, properties like that. I was rather surprised, um, at, you know, particularly this city and even some of the middle-class okay neighborhoods here that people were doing that. People had this misconception that this happened in poor places, so to speak, right? That's not true. It's, it's a, it, was a, it was a widespread issue, regardless of affluency or non-affluency. So, you know, eventually, the you know, shelter crisis had reached a crescendo ourselves. And uh, that took like five years, really, to, to get to a crescendo. Uh, this was a crescendo today. And that's why I keep reminding folks, we've done this before. We've just never done it this way. Right, this fast, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, what could be some other... Revenue sources, do you think, that could generate uh, <laughs> the ability to fill that gap? Well, we don't have too uh, many options really on the table. I mean, online lottery has something you've been battered about again. Um, as you all know, I'm not wicked warm to M- online lottery, but I do think online is inevitability, with, particularly with uh, sports betting already in play. Uh, and you have casinos in the state. Um, you know, obviously taxing is not a favorable item by anyone that nobody likes to hear. Uh, 
the three letter word with a T. Um, so we obviously would like to avoid that uh, if possible. And I suspect we will. I just have a hard time seeing the speaker saying, let's put down some taxes. I just, I just have a hard time seeing it. Uh, the reality is that there really is no real strong options remaining on revenue generation. Um, you know, all types of business revenues are even uh, tapped out in that sense. And of course, you have the millionaires tax that's already kicked in. Right. And, uh, it, it's unpredictable because it's so new. Um, and capital gains doesn't matter because it goes to the rainy day fund. So, you know, we have an $8.2 billion rainy day fund we could draw from. You know, so I, I do think we can get through several fiscal cycles keeping core services intact. Uh, but you need, just because of a big rainy day fund, you can't drain it all around. I mean, just like, you know, every household, you're going to belt tighten first, you know, retreat to uh, your essential needs, uh, essential payments. And then, you know, then you start drawing down from rainy day. And that's that's the philosophy we have. Right. God forbid there's another pandemic or snowmageddon or whatever. Yeah. Or terrorist attack. You yeah. know, I'm sorry to say, I mean, none of us expected the Boston bombing. Unfortunately, we were, it's okay. I don't want to say it was great for school years. I mean, we were still in the financial crisis of 08. It took five, six years to get out of it. But you had rainy day funds available uh, still to, you know, put, put some money in. And we did that in a, a informal session the week of the bombing to put money available right away for police overtime immediately. Um, so, you know, we, we can we can draw on rainy day funds here and there uh, to make it work. And, um, you know, we also uh, allowed, uh, we're going to be allowing the governor as soon as the House of Senate reaches a agreement to allow the governor to draw on the interest from the day fund, not the principal, just the interest under certain conditions. There are caps and controls uh, to use that money to leverage um, the massive infrastructure money that's going to be coming to the state to help pay for our share of it. If you're ready to go, the feds are going to give you the money, right? So that's another potential offset in the sense of revenue sources and bonding that we can use uh, to keep the bond debt down and you know not use taxpayer dollars for uh, well, not taxpayer dollars in the sense of you know income tax dollars, but interest mm -hmm. generated from the rainy day fund to help with that. But it yeah. isn't it isn't a permanent solution in the sense of the fact that you know it is such a big gap. So yeah, you know, again, it's a lot of little pieces together. And maybe some of the governor's initiatives don't become part of the budget. We just decide that it's just too expensive or it's not the right time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, again, you can kind of get sense, I hope, from what I'm talking about. It's a lot of moving parts. It's mm -hmm. not like here's one solution to solve all your problems. It's trying to right. kind of cost work a bunch of different solutions. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, like you say, it's going to take time to play out. You know, and I think the, the, the bigger picture hope is that the, the migrants that are coming that go through the system and, and, and get jobs contribute back to the economy. Well, that is the work we're doing now. I mean, the governor's office you know, has been making a strong effort and we you know, acquired some lawyers like a talk in past shows as part of our uh, appropriation process, the governor's office to you know help with work permits. And we have various not-for-profit groups around the state that are already stretched out because they're helping in the refugee crisis too. And, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of moving parts. I mean, there are Afghans, there are Ukrainians, there are Haitians, there are Bhutanese. There are a lot of actually other refugees that you've never seen or heard about uh, living in Quincy. Uh, but other communities also manage an issue on top of the migrant crisis as well. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, the state's actually, believe it or not, very welcoming to foreigners. I mean, it's not like immigrants are not welcomed here. It's just that we have a lot of different uh, circumstances going off at the same time that's being borne by the state and the local level, and the feds just walked away from us. So, you know, um, you know, it's we're cleaning up somebody else's mess, but it's people, and people, we help people, and trying to figure out the best way to do it is not an easy thing to do. Speaking of infrastructure, I don't know. Did we talk last time about um, had the had the Baltimore Bridge uh, tragedy occurred yet? I don't think we talked about that. No, that happened over the weekend. Yeah, uh, very rare. I see this level of disaster. Really? And, yeah. Yeah, and the tragedy of six folks, uh, two bodies recovered. I'm not sure. I haven't checked later if they found the other four. Not as of uh, a couple hours ago. Yeah. Yeah, and amazing. Uh, no more fatalities and, and injuries. And apparently, yeah. it was a fire on the ship. And uh, supposedly it had to cut off the engines because of the fire. Now the thing's kind of drifting. Yeah. Now, put it in perspective, I mean, this thing is this large barge, fully loaded, 
And uh, when that thing goes adrift, I mean, you know, mass plus any kind of speed equals immense amount of force, right? So, um, yeah, but I mean, it, it just went down the, the middle of the bridge. It didn't hit like a, a, a support structure or something like that. Um, and I just don't know what you could have done to, you know, to have the ship do something else. I mean, but I mean, the question is, how did it get to that point where it was kind of loose in the water? I mean, for lack of a better term. Basically, yeah. It was a runaway, a runaway ship, basically, yeah. Yeah, we've talked about supply chains and everything else, and this is kind of a variation of that. Route one is now being a diversion. So all your truck traffic and other stuff that traffic, truck traffic, transport, I mean, has to circle around the bridge, which asks, again, asks, adds, adds uh, time and fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also affects shipping traffic as the feds and the state you know, are trying to activate a port, another port nearby. Uh, to unload cargo. Yeah, I wonder if Boston will be part of that that contingency plan. I couldn't tell you right now. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. in the Bedford are two big shipping ports. Mm -hmm. um, they may have to do diversions, which again, you know, the reason ports are picked today where they're picked because again, they want efficiency of speed. Mm -hmm. Move stuff quickly. Again, time and fuel, two very important things uh, to try to reduce as much fuel as possible and reduce time as possible. But I mean, it's going to not just affect cargo track, but traffic, but also you know, moving stuff that are um, based on trucks. Right. And, uh, I didn't realize this, but there's like a Domino sugar plant down there. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's the main access point, as well as cars. A lot of cars go to there. I heard about the cars, yeah. Yeah, so I was very surprised. I mean, I don't know anything about that port. Why would I? It's Maryland. Right. You know, as I read this here and there, as I'm trying to read on my news feeds, um yeah this is gonna be a big problem in the yeah. north yeah it's it's you know it, it, i mean if if somebody had wanted to to take out uh, a main shipping port that would have been the ideal way to do it you know if it was intentional so hopefully it doesn't give anybody any ideas <laughs> i love the conspiracy theories already starting regarding like you know this there's, there's a i saw someone send me a post that this is an ai error the bridge has no ai to it it's a no. And the oh, ship is over 50 years old. There was no AI when it was built. <laughs> yeah. And then it's a, a ship. I mean, a mechanical failure has no AI component. So I'm kind of like, yeah, these, I love these rapidly rising conspiracy theories on a non computerized bridge, essentially, because it's mm -hmm. like as an AI running that bridge and, you know, a cargo ship, essentially. And no amount of AI is going to stop that bridge, much less start a fire. It's not like the computer decided to light a bunch of matches next to some fuel. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's amazing how quickly um, mm -hmm. you do that. It's also amazing how people use their credentials, like former media people, um, you know, people questionable scientific um, credentials or questionable publications. You know, we use that you know as credibility for what they say on the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just check your sources, folks. Uh, you know, just know where you're getting your information and, and, and verify. Yeah. And also uh, can use a little degree of common sense here. It's That's a fifth foot bridge. There is no computer. No, as a matter of fact, th th you know, they, they had to put up physical blockades to stop the traffic from going over just minutes before it was collapsing. Yeah, exactly. Um, it also shows you the size of our infrastructure, right? The whole mm -hmm. country touches each other. Uh, every state touches each state. Every country around us, Mexico, Canada, touches the United States. And uh, all the shipping comes in and out of and out of the, um, in and out of the uh, country, you know, also all touch each other. So, you know, globalization, interstate commerce, you know, uh, our own regional trading block. I mean, you know, we are integrated to each other. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the question a lot about whether or not this is going to slow down certain segments of supply chain locally, uh, meaning this region, uh, and whether or not it's going to result in some increased costs again um, mm -hmm. associated with this region. And, of course, there's an insurance company component, obviously, which I'm sure the insurers are trying to figure out what they're going to do here in terms of the recovery. Right. And it's also the same thing. I get that feel off the ship. That too, yeah. It's, there's there's a lot going on. Is and the cargo that's in those containers on the ship as well. 
Yeah, and you've seen these cargoes in the news, and it's massive. You have these cranes pulling them off. So I really don't have an answer for you. Uh, structural engineers, you know, have to do this safely, uh, considering the environmental hazards, mm. uh, as well as human safety, mm. um, as well as don't want the bridge to keep coming down. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Lots to consider. So just, just, uh, yeah. And amazing to watch, you know, just to watch how it happened. It just couldn't have been more perfect <laughs> in, a, in a tragic way. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, we're living a lot of bad news and it contributes to people's moods. Mm. Mm. Right? More bad news that's in the media and people seem to be addicted to their social media as well as their standard news media on television. Uh, and uh, the more you feed bad news to people, uh, the more it feeds a negative attitude. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we always talk about the economy here, and there's actually been still good news with the economy, at least the latest data showing pretty strong manufacturing data. Yeah, manufacturing is strong. Consumer uh, consumer confidence is like a C minus, ain't great. Yeah, that's about right, yeah. Yeah, consumer confidence is not great, but consumers are still spending a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, you know, core, uh, you know, production, uh, PCE, you know, core index, uh, you know, is expected still under three, even though CPI is over three. Uh, fuel prices are clearly going up because, you know, you know, this gas price has gone up in Quincy and you go to Boston, it really goes up. Uh, so it's about 315 ish, give or take so, five. Yeah, the barrel of oil is now almost $85 a barrel. So it's gone up quite a bit. Yeah, the Middle East impact is finally coming. Food, steam, and the Red Sea. Uh, on on the global fuel prices, um, and the uh, GDP adjustments going back over three percent. Um, healthy U.S. economy in terms of uh, stable prices and wages is approximately two percent. Mm -hmm. So the economy is still running hot, and uh, well, we're flying past twenty seven trillion dollars in GDP. To put in perspective, pre pandemic it was sitting closer to twenty one thousand twenty one trillion dollars. Astounding! Yeah, think about that. That's a that's four year only in four years. Yeah, we haven't seen this kind of growth since post World War II. Right. Uh, as a result of super hard economy, it's it it makes everything a bit more expensive, or a lot more expensive than what we're talking about in, in different sectors. And the country is non-uniform. So what happens in Massachusetts is the same in California, which is in the same in Oklahoma, which is in the same in Texas, we're doing the same in Wyoming. Right. So I mean, everywhere is different how they're feeling these impacts, but on a big number level, yeah, I mean, you know, the world's strongest economy, biggest economy continues to grow unusually quick mm -hmm. um the last uh four years um and this is massive ripple effect um i'm not looking for the economy to drop dead at all i am not but you know getting it under three percent you know closer to two and a half would be fairly healthy for the economy to kind of um uh, ease ourselves into a um you know a more stagnated price structure yeah, that's, I know that's what the Fed's looking for. So it's a question about what they're going to do with interest rates is still up in the air. Yeah, agreed. The second biggest economy is China, between seventeen, eighteen trillion dollars, depending on whose math you use. And uh, they're in a stagnated situation. I mean, they were approximately seventeen trillion dollars prior to the pandemic, and and they're still trapped uh, in that same zone, give or take, you know, a few percentage points depending on who you talk to. Uh, and again, they went on a highly regulated, controlled economic um, economy. They're not a free market economy in the way we do our free market economy. But in meanwhile, countries like India, you know, which had a very questionable COVID experience, um, if you paid attention, India's COVID experience very, very uh, messy. Um, you know, has rocketed into the top ten strongly in terms of its economy. So in Japan, um, you know, has uh, dropped to number four, despite the fact their economy is growing for the first time in 30-odd years. Mm. Uh, Germany has moved to the number three spot after China. And the Gulf is you know, almost $10 trillion from China down to Japan and, and Germany, to give you an idea of the size differential being big matters um, in terms of population and resource, mm. resource rich. Um, so even though the U.S. is a smaller population, I mean, we're resource rich, we're a free economy. Um, we're a regulated economy, we're a pro-consumer economy, um, and it, it makes a difference. So, yeah, good numbers all around on economic news, but people still feel pretty unhappy because prices are still high. People still feel pinched. And, you know, there's only bad news in the news, which also doesn't help. Mm. 
Yeah, it's yeah, a lot of it is you're right, emotion. True. Yeah, people are exhausted. War in Ukraine, the tragedy and horrors of the, of the Gaza Israeli situation. Um, you know, you have uh, if you really look around, I mean you got a you got massacres going on in Miramir and this crazy civil war still. I mean, domestically there's another shooting, seems like every other week, another type of mass shooting somewhere in this country. Um and of course the presidential election is going to heat up to be quite a bit of uh won't name names, but just straight up name calling and lack of actual substance which uh, basically going to either people eat it up or they're going to be inferior by depending on where you are. Uh, and, um, you know, optics matters. And uh, strong leadership generally means good optics and leadership, and people don't have confidence in the optics at the moment. And the weather's still crummy, too. <laughs> it's on top yeah. of it all. <laughs> this has been a wacky, warm, cold, warm, cold, with a lot of wind. Uh, this weekend's a classic example of a, rainy crappy friday followed by a windy saturday plus a sort of okay sunday <laughs> we're gonna have like a couple of nor'easters tomorrow being wednesday and thursday just to mess up our travel day in terms of work for those of you who are going to work uh we do have a formal session i do have to show up <laughs> and uh, and we have, I have two days full of meetings as well so you know it is a it doesn't help our mood in new england but as you can tell i'm kind of conscientious of the of the effects on all our psyches mm. um, regarding the environment we live today, regarding everything from the weather, which is kind of like, you know, we're New Englanders. I mean, we, we should be accepting that this is kind of how this works up here. It's but true. I, <laughs> Although we, we always hold out hope, I think, that it's going to get better. <laughs> you always hold out hope for a steady five days or something good, right? <laughs> um but also, again, I mean, real life things regarding your pocketbook and my pocketbook and uh, and also you know, the impact on, you know, all the media that's hitting us yeah. uh, all the time. And it does affect you how you think. I mean, it really does. I mean, yeah. what you read, what, you know, triggers your emotions, you know, appeals to different parts of who you are. Um, and sometimes it's a good idea to take a deep breath, sit back and you know, really decide, you know, was this really worth getting your hairs up? <laughs> yeah, prioritize is always important for sure, you know, uh, and, and be grateful for, for the things that you do have and your family and your health. Oh, I say this all the time. I mean, I'm very grateful to have the job I have. I'm very thankful to voters that let me have the job I have. And, you know, I have you know, a lot of fun with this. Like, you know, we can talk about the Korean Consulate dinner next, if you like, which was last. I was just going to ask you about that, actually. Yeah, because I remember you went last week. Yeah. Yeah, an yeah, example of something that was uh, fun. Uh, in terms of a changing stimuli conversation, uh, you know, the Asian caucus uh, with you know, Donna Wong and Trong Nguyen, Bena Howard, Edgar Idahoven, uh, Roddy Mom, we sat with the Council General Kim, uh, who's appointed uh, less than nine months now. Mm -hmm. uh, he's actually Generation X. He's closer to my age. He was actually stationed in Boston as a very young attache 25 odd years ago. And oh. he's actually, he's now living in his boss's house 25 years later. Oh, wow. Talk about irony. Interesting. Yeah, the house is assigned. The Koreans own the property. I see. Gotcha. Own the property, right? So we talk about like, like Korea is uh, putting $80 billion in investment in Massachusetts regarding R&D research, bringing their companies in and collaborating with other companies locally on biotech, on um, straight up hardware, software. Uh, they're developing flying cars. It's one of the locations. Boston's a research location for flying car tech. Uh, New fuel cell technology in our location uh, in the global stage that the Koreans are investing in um, the technology here. It is a Boston is safe in the sense that it's a geopolitically safe location. Um, we have a good law regarding intellectual property rights. Mm. A highly educated state. Uh, we are still a state that does a lot of high tech manufacturing. Very appealing uh, for our Korean industries to come down. Uh, the Korean president uh, Yoon. Uh, very impressive Boston. We found out they had many choices with cities when he visited last April. Uh, his second stop was Boston. He would like to return to one more visit during his term of office. Uh, Korean presidents only get to serve one five-year term. There is no opportunity for a second term. So, so he's midway through his first term, and he would like to make a second visit, uh, which, of course, creates a lot of pressure for the local consulate to make sure everything's perfect when the big boss shows up, right? Right, of course, yes, yeah. 
So he was happy he wasn't the consul general at the time. Uh, <laughs> because he didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. As you guys can all imagine, I hope you all appreciate when the president, which is your country's president, and you're the uh, uh, local foreign affairs folks in the country and city where you're stationed and uh, your big, big boss is coming, you can imagine the stress levels. I hope you appreciate that kind of stress levels <laughs> <laughs> that it creates for the, the consul general and the staff. So, But uh, he may be experiencing that, he thinks. Uh, we talk about a little geopolitics, and one of the things that we don't see here uh, easily, because it's not like we pay attention to that part of the world much, but Kim Jong-un, who's the um, the dictator of North Korea, essentially, um, has made new BFF. His best friends forever is now Vladimir Putin over at Xi Jinping in China. And uh, you may be aware that Putin's buying a lot of old Cold, Cold, War, Cold War weapons uh, from uh, North Korea because the uh, supply of weapons in Russia has been slow in manufacturing because they moved to a full-time war economy, which there are now, where every domestic uh, manufacturing shifted to war mode. Um, it takes time to shift. So they were buying a lot of North Korean weapons. I'm sure the North Koreans were compensated quite nicely for those weapons. And uh, willing now to become a satellite partner with Russia regarding financial assistance, essentially local aid for the country. Yeah. And they're using oil money. And of course, they have oil and they need oil in, in North Korea. There is no fossil fuel opportunity. It's a mountainous region. And uh, you know that's why they want nuclear reactors, one, to terrorize everyone, but also because they need the energy. And nuclear power is something you have because they have no fossil fuels. They have no other renewable tech. They have no windmills, no solar panels. And that area is super cloudy. The wind's terrible. They have almost no coastal access for wind access to water. So they depend on fossil fuels, which they do not have any, because they don't have, literally don't have any. And, um, you know, that's why there's nuclear terror, plus, you know, Russian partnership. And uh, I had visited Korea, uh, uh, South Korea, on the uh, diplomatic mission in 2014, uh, as a guest of the South Korean government. And then I did visit the DMZ, which is remarkable. Um, and uh, one of the things they have on both sides of the DMZ is uh, identical facing monuments. You know, with peace, unity, and and uh, hope that that there will, there'll be one people, one Korean people in the peninsula. Mm. And uh, the North Korea side has removed those monuments. Oh, I see. Okay, that is a problem. The New York, yes. oh, it's just some monuments. Took some signs down. Big deal. No, it's a sign of political shift, of foreign policy in North Korea regarding the attitude towards towards the southern neighbor. And also changes the communication of how you have to approach North Koreans, which is very hermit kingdom, you're kind of guessing. So it's easy to sit in our little chairs at home like this saying, oh, he's just a crazy dictator. No, he's not crazy. He has an agenda. It's just understanding what the agenda is. And 50 million people, you know, in a vulnerable position, which you don't need modern weaponry. You can hit it from World War One weapons Yeah. Um, to basically kill millions of people in one strike in a short time period. So people forget about the Korean War, but it was it was quite horrific. Oh, well, Korean War was very very brutal. Uh, I know Korean War, well, the Korean War veterans are slowly passing away as we lose our greatest generation. But Korean was very very, um, and a lot of Koreans died. A lot of Koreans, not military but civilians, all through the. And uh, it's a country that you know, has a huge U.S. military presence. It's the mm -hmm. only US military base on the Asian continent. Now that we've left Afghanistan, which is also on the Asian continent, the second one was Afghanistan. And, you know, it's a huge security component in you know, their top five economy. So, and they made it's a good hero, and the major trade partner in the Massachusetts, not, you know, as well as the entire U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked a lot about that stuff. It's interesting to hear the perception of, of folks regarding what's actually going on on the ground in, their, in those countries. And yes. How even domestic politics, they're in parliamentary elections. Um, they split us expecting uh, perhaps a split situation where they have one party run parliament and the, and the president of a separate party. Um, third parties have risen trying to disrupt uh, the mm -hmm. status quo. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how how that works. And they actually have impeached the president. We actually talked a bit about the last impeachment where they actually did impeach and remove a president. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, she was uh, very problematic on a corruption scheme. And I see. Even her own party just abandoned her at one point. She was wow. reached that level of intolerance. Very different from Americans. Yes. And 
The reason is very simple. It's because Koreans have been under military dictatorship before they had a modern democracy. Modern democracy didn't actually occur until the 90s. Right, and they so, don't want to go back there, I'm sure. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's why they have a one-term, five-year president. Mm -hmm. That's why there's a whole impeachment mechanism. They do have a criminal investigation you know, separately and all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is completely designed to pre prevent another military dictator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. Nobody, nobody in this country remembers um, <laughs> British rule <laughs> over the colonies. <laughs> that is true. It's been a long time since we had unseat uh, uh, someone else in charge of this country, right? In terms of just like you know, I'm going to do it my way and screw you people. Uh, <laughs> I think, they, yeah, next year's the the 250th anniversary of the revolution. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. But uh, you know, South Korea has a government that's designed specifically. You know, to prevent another military dictator. Mm. And, uh, it works. And mm -hmm. like I said, it uh, became less about a political interest of parties and became mm -hmm. an interest of security of the nation. And uh, frankly, we could learn a lesson about that. Um, we should uh, probably comment, Tacky, on the passing of a uh, former Congressman William Delahunt this week. Yeah, uh, counselor, state rep, district attorney, and congressman. So, uh, Who's a remarkable figure in politics? Some younger folks may not remember him, uh, but a lot of us in politics have at least spent a little bit of time, you know, at the Bill uh, Delahunt table to uh, get some sound advice in politics. Uh, with his experience over many years, uh, and uh, you know, a very place to learn how things work. I mean, he was a you know fountain of wisdom through his time, but he also knew he also knew it was time to call it quits. He didn't stay longer than he needed to. He knew. Where it's time to move on. And I think that's underappreciated. He could have been a congressman to today. Mm -hmm. He chose those time, time was time, and he, he moved on. Um, in case you're wondering, he already had his pension from the district attorney's office. So he was not exactly motivated by um, a pension. Um, so, and I know Congress pensions start much differently than state pensions. Mm -hmm. much but not talking about it. He just uh, left Congress because it was time. Yeah, it's 2010, I think, so for quite a while. Yeah. yeah. Did a decade. Yeah. And then he watched things change over that decade uh, on the political environment in DC. And you know, I actually did ask him that question. He goes, it's really kind of sad how that place has evolved uh, from um, much more congeal, professional, mm -hmm. um, high quality folks that understand uh, the importance of relationship development to what you see now. Well, I, I remember asking him about that, and and he, you know, he said we need Republicans in order to get things done. He, he understood. He understood the process, hmm. and he was very worldly too. I mean, he did take the opportunity in D.C. as member of foreign affairs to go around the world, mm -hmm. talking to other leaders in other countries. And I think people here in Quincy realize that Congressman Lynch does the same thing. Uh, Congressman Keating does that as well, um, where they actually do travel. Uh, and do learn from other countries and talk to other leaders in other countries. As you've seen, I've had the gracious opportunity of, of you know, talking to uh, uh, foreign attaches that are stationed in uh, Boston, but they actually got to go regularly with the State Department, representing our country, talking about legit issues that are affecting both nations, both domestically and uh, internationally and, and uh, bilaterally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bill has you know, a ton of experience understanding places like Cuba, for example. Mm -hmm. He has a full grasp of the Cuban people as well as the government and the various dynamics that are involved. And that comes from a very, not just smart person, but a keen political mind to see all those moving parts. And, uh, you know, we're people business. It's politics. And to understand how other government works, you, just, you have to understand uh, politics. Even though it's not my politics, it's not my government, but you know we don't have a background uh, on uh, dynamics. City government's not the same as state government, which is the same as federal government, which is not the same as county government, right? So, you know, just different principle. And he's had experience, counselor, state rep, yep. district attorney, no Congress, right? He's he's actually worked in four levels of government in in uh, in the United States, and you know he was uniquely suited to to see other folks in different countries and understand their government systems and the dynamics associated with it. And of course, yes. he's a local charitable person. I mean, he will have Congress made money, put a lot of money back in our communities. 
And he gave me a behind the scenes tour of the Capitol once many, many, many years ago. And I got to see the revered Senate dining room. <laughs> really? I, yes. I uh, have yet to visit the Capitol, actually. <laughs> it was a, it was an eye opening tour. There are there are underground tunnels that connect all the federal office buildings uh, throughout Washington, D.C. that that he took me down. in. so it was really fun. Uh, I, I uh, uh, I'm shameful to admit I have yet to visit the Capitol building. It's really worth it, Jackie. If if you ever get the opportunity, I'd highly recommend it. Yeah, I gotta either get there. I gotta get there at some point somehow. Uh, as a child, I did visit D.C., but we never made it into the Capitol. We did all the yeah. outdoor um, visits. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's like, so much to see. Yeah, like we saw. I remember seeing money being printed to the Treasury. Right, they have the, yeah. like, the super protected, invulnerable glass <laughs> that you can yeah. see stuff happening, but. Um, yeah, I've, I've never had a capital visit, so. Yeah, it's no, well, and, and the Library of Congress also is is a well, well worth your time. It's it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's on my to-do list as well as you know, other traveling. I will hopefully get a chance to enjoy at some point this year. Yeah. Uh, but no, I'm going to miss Bill. I'm going to miss, we'll miss Bill. Um, yeah. I think the last time I saw Bill was um, Frank Bellotti, 100th birthday. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing Bill at um, the dedication of the uh, Devon Courthouse in his name. Yeah, it's named in his honor. That's right. Yep. In his honor. So it, I think it's also good when people name things after you while still alive. It, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what should we what should we name after you, Tech? <laughs> well, again, my friends always joke, you know, put my name on a porter party, the official state porter party. <laughs> we'll we'll put it happen. out on Wallaston Beach, Tacky's Tacky's place. <laughs> you heard me tell this joke a couple of times already on this podcast about about my friend's uh, respect for me regarding the fact that like, yeah, you can travel with the state and your death. Stick your name in something mobile like a porta potty, which is essential. So uh, nice friends you have there. <laughs> they keep it real. I will. Uh, I will not lie. I mean, one of the advantages of uh, being a local politician is that you have local folks to keep you real, uh, and yeah. uh, there's no uh, sucking up. <laughs> and that's something we all need. We all need you know, friends that aren't afraid to just slap you uh, every so often when you get a little ahead of yourself. And, uh, I think hopefully you can tell from our conversations that you know. I do the job I need to do, and the same as Bill. I mean, you had to be what you need to be to get the job done, but, you know, all the other times you are how you are, and you sit with Bill Delahunt, you just sit in with Bill. That's right. Yeah, man, gonna, that's, that's a great way to describe it, yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to miss that. And uh, and also, let's say, he has revolutionary work in the DA's office, I mean, domestic violence in particular, civil rights. He was ahead of his time. Oh, yeah, so Dove was was a was a, uh, a product of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, you know, and then a whole generation of folks will know because of the nature of our business, you know, it's, you know, when time passes, time passes, like, say, right. you know, Bill was aware, very aware of that, you know, when you're out, you're out, and you know, the expectation of a whole generation to know who you are, it's just, that's how this game works. Um, for, it, for, yeah. for all of us, though, right, we all want to try and just leave a little something better than when we, when we first started. Yeah, no, no, I'm absolutely correct. I mean, I you know, we joked a little bit about the courthouse with him, but, um, but uh, you know, most of the stuff he's done, you know, it's not on his name of the courthouse. It's stuff that makes a quality of life better. That you never know where it came from. You assume it's always there. That's right. That's right. It's a good, good way to end it today, I think, Tacky. Yep. He's a, uh, try to remember his services. He's a uh, church of the presidents on Friday. Yep. Two, to, two seven. to seven. Yep. And uh, his mass, it's on my calendar. Yes. Saturday, 11 at St. Gregory's in Dorchester, actually. Yeah, yeah, St. Gregory's. Yeah, it's on my calendar now. But definitely, uh, it's definitely part of my weekend travels. Uh, also, yeah. happy birthday to the Marymount Association. So it's just oh. going on a happy note. Uh, go on a happy note here. Uh, happy birthday to Marymount Association. The Saturday is going to be the 100th birthday party. Um, and also, want to remind folks, your favorite podcast on Google is going away. Google is canceling the podcast service. If you haven't seen that notice enough, Get you know, emails. Obviously, QA TV is part of a podcast service, and uh, I don't understand how to use uh, YouTube music. I can't figure this thing out easily on uh, getting to my podcast. But uh, you know, just a little reminder uh, at the end of the show if you're using Google Podcasts, I'm sure you see it in the banner up top, but 
just want to give you my day to continue to listen to me and Joe. You know, definitely switch to another podcast. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We're on all kinds of different platforms. So definitely. Yep. Okay. So, how do we get a hold of you, Jackie? Oh, do we have to get a hold of me? Of uh, course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 617-722-2370, 617-722-2370. It is uh, Chairman Paracello's office. If uh, the front desk doesn't pick up right away, you get the automated system. So please be aware that you hear Chairman Paracello, not Chairman Chan. So um, you have to wait to get through the prompts if the front desk doesn't pick up. Tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T-A-C-K-E-Y at mahouse.gov. Um, even just the time that we've been chatting here, I've already received um, some 20 odd emails wow. just really quickly. Um, so obviously we'll hit that point where uh, emails are coming hot and heavy regarding the budget. Um, stay with the Tacky Channel on Facebook. This is how Joe knows where I am. So you can make questions about where I've been and why I'm doing what I'm doing. But it's also, you know, some happy components to it. You know, uh, Student Government Day is this Friday, for example. Right? We have a Quincy uh, Youth Point to the governor's youth council, for example. So, you know, it brings a little bit of state house to you through the state representative Tacky Chan Facebook, as well as at tackychan.com. I'm sorry, dot gov, at tackychan.gov, dot gov. Uh, dot org, I think. Dot org. Lord and yep. mercy. <laughs> Lord and mercy. I'm getting confused. <laughs> it's that, all right. Uh, I got you covered. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joe. Tackychan.org is a resource page. Again, you find some phone numbers. Um, and of course, MA legislature.gov is the state mm -hmm. website. Um, again, I strongly encourage people to visit the website. You can watch public hearings. You can watch the sessions. You can look up bills on your own. Um, that website and my internal system was synced. There is what I see is what you see. Um, so I have no special uh, information that's not public already. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, we have uh, Attacky Chan on X. Did I mention that already? I'm getting yes. You know, Joe, I've done this like literally like 300 times and I still can't remember. <laughs> tell. Um, and of course, QAT with Joe, with Joe can constantly correct me. Why don't you just tell everybody where I am, Joe? We've done this enough. Um, you know, on his uh, at Quincy in the AM, you get your 10 minute important uh, blurrow local stuff, um, as well as listen to Joe's many interviews uh, with not just me, but many other elected and um, law for profits and business leaders. Um, and of course, you no know, marks in the next room getting the speaker. Um, I think Joe's got a better deal today, just saying. <laughs> um, of course, you know, I do end up on Mark Crosby as well. And, um, and that goes out to the to the entire, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, community television network. Yes. But, but we're immortal on YouTube and uh, and your favorite podcast stations. So. That's correct. <laughs> we'll, we'll live on in infamy. <laughs> we're living immortally in, in this medium. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Tacky. Thank you, Joe. I'll catch you in a week.